Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're very pleased to bring you the latest in E4C's 2016 webinar series on the topic of prototyping on a budget. My name is Yana Aranda, and I'm the Director of Programs here at Engineering for Change, and I'll be your moderator for today. I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit more about today's webinar. The cost of developing and bringing a product to market can be significant, especially when ventures might be making thousands of products in order to keep manufacturing costs low. Prototyping is an essential step in ensuring that innovators avoid making very expensive mistakes by testing as many concepts, parameters, and assumptions as the project budget allows before committing to piloting and manufacturing. <clears throat> Organizations developing technology for development often struggle with prototyping on a tight budget. So, We've invited Ryan Vineyard, engineering lead at Highway 1, to share his insights on the many options to prototype affordably and effectively to get products to market quickly. Welcome and thank you. Before we get rolling, I'd also like to thank the E4C webinar series team in general. If anybody out there has questions about the series or would like to make a recommendation for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact the team via the email address listed on the slide. The webinar you're participating in today is part of E4C's professional development offerings. Information on upcoming installments in the series, as well as archived videos of past presentations can be found on the E4C webinars page. And if you're following us on Twitter today, I'd like to invite you to join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. Before we move on to our presenter, I'd like to tell you a bit more about Engineering for Change and who we are. E4C is a knowledge exchange platform and global community of over 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities, <clears throat> including access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. Membership provides cost-free access to relevant and current news, professional development resources, including opportunities such as jobs and fellowships, and a growing database of hundreds of poverty alleviating products in our solutions library. E4C members enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with our site, the better we'll be able to serve you resources aligned to your interests. We invite you to join our passionate global community and contribute to making people's lives better across the world. Check out our website to learn more and sign up. Today's webinar is a collaborative effort with the ASME iShow, a hardware-led social innovation competition open to individuals and organizations taking physical products to market that will have a social impact. Upcoming iShow sponsored webinars will focus on issues related to hardware-based solutions and provide practical insights from the iShow expert network. As you can see, we have three more coming up in the series, and we hope you'll join them for all of, us, all of them. Our next webinar is going to be on April 21st at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on the topic of design, testing, and implementation of a life-saving product in resource-constrained settings. We'll be joined by Dr. Stephen Harston of Intellectual Ventures. Um, for those of you who are members of E4C, you will receive an invitation directly. And for those of you who are not, we invite you to visit the link listed in order to register. Now, a few housekeeping items before we get started. I'd love to see where everyone is from today. So in the chat window, uh, please type in your location. And if you don't see the chat, please click on the icon on the top right-hand corner in order to access it. So I'll get us started here. I am joining everybody from New York today. All right. And uh, you can also use the chat window to type in any remarks you may have for everybody. Oh, Welcome, everybody. I see a number of folks are here from California, Michigan, Brooklyn, North Carolina, all over we have here in Minnesota. Welcome, everyone. If you want to have any questions for the presenter, please use the Q&A window located below the chat to type them in. Again, if you don't see this, you can access it by clicking the Q&A icon on the top right-hand corner. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any trouble, try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening up WebEx in a different browser. 
Following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour for this session, please follow the instructions at the top of the E4C professional development page. The URL is listed. And I see a number of folks have uh, indicated their location. Some in the Q&A. Do please use the chat window for general comments and the Q&A just for questions so we can keep track for the presenter. And welcome to everybody from New Jersey to Netherlands to uh, Chicago and so forth. We're very excited to have you join us today. All right, and with that, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Ryan Vineyard. As I mentioned, he's the engineering lead at Highway One, a hardware-focused startup accelerator located in San Francisco under parent company TCH. He is also the co-author of The Hardware Startup, a fantastic book. I wish to check it out. He came to PCH through its consulting arm, Lime Lab, where he developed consumer products for Fortune 500 brands. Previously, Ryan worked at startups in the clean tech and electric vehicle space, where he developed novel powertrain, motor control, and thermal systems. Ryan holds a Bachelor of Science in Product Design from Stanford University. Welcome, Ryan, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Yana. Um, first, I'd like to start by thanking Yana and the, the hosts at ASME, uh, E4C, as well as the iShow. Uh, for this opportunity to get information out there about prototyping and a, a bit about manufacturing. Um, thanks for the intro and, and a bit of the background there. Uh, so today we're here to talk about prototyping on a budget. Uh, this can really be a challenge uh, for anyone anywhere in the world, um, no matter what phase of, of, the, uh, of development you're in. Um, a lot of what we'll talk through in this lecture is really about uh, redefining prototyping as a learning tool and not necessarily a rush towards manufacturing. Um, and how, how redefining that can help you get there at a less risky path. And then also address urethane casting, a very specific uh, kind of middle ground process where you can start to get quantity units uh, with more, more prototyping friendly tools. So quickly, my background, Yana went over a bit of this, um, but after doing product design at Stanford, I worked at a few uh, clean tech electric vehicle startups around the Bay Area. Um, and then I've been at PCH for four years now, uh, first doing a more traditional product development consulting through Lime Lab, uh, and then with Highway One since the beginning, uh, advising 67 startups through six cohorts, uh, all throughout the prototyping process on the march towards manufacturability and fundraising. <clears throat> uh, as Yana mentioned, also co-author of the hardware startup. Uh, if you like what you hear here, you know, go learn more there. Um, if anyone's interested, you know, shoot me an email. My email is at the end of the uh, presentation, and I can give you a discount code as well. Um, some good stuff in there about uh, the entire process, um, not just prototyping and manufacturing, which is definitely what we'll focus on today. So in terms of prototyping, I wanted to start with a, a bit of a framework. Uh, I really like to think about prototyping in two-dimensional, three-dimensional, and four-dimensional. Uh, and I want to I slow down and define these, because I think, in general, um, people, and especially startups who might be new to hardware, really jump into 3D prototyping um, too early and, and aren't learning enough, um, partially about the prototyping process, but mainly about their users. So I want to talk through this a little bit. So two-dimensional prototyping, what I mean by that, that really starts with a napkin sketch, uh, the whiteboard idea, the ideation session, the brainstorm with each other. <clears throat> and this is key to really iterate faster. Uh, I think a lot of people these days, you know, CAD and 3D printing is so accessible, which is helpful, but staying in 2D can help you ideate and even help you get better feedback from users than you would with a more fine 3D prototype that they might mistake as more of a finished good. You know, 3D uh, is a little bit more obvious. You know, 3D CAD is very powerful these days. Um, you know, Autodesk, I know, is a sponsor of the, the iShow as well. They have very accessible Fusion 360 software. Uh, that can help you get in and start making. Um, <clears throat> but I, I don't want to focus on 3D as much today because I think there's there's plenty of information out there about it. And four-dimensional, what I mean by that, everyone, when I kind of mention this framework, is kind of like 4D, what's he talking about? Um, you know, four-dimensional, by that I mean your video prototype. Uh, and the most common these days is obviously the crowdfunding, the Kickstarter video, uh, to really tell your story, your message, and explain the experience of the product. Because uh, so many hardware products are about the experience these days and the integration with software and really, you know, how it takes an old product and, and makes it smarter, makes it new. Um, the videos are such a key part of that. It doesn't always have to be crowdfunding. You know, we, uh, 
we and most other accelerators have teams prepare video for applications. Um, so that's definitely also an area where, um, where it can be helpful, but in general, a lot of my, my message here is that four-dimensional prototypes are a really big milestone. Uh, they take a lot of investment, they take a lot of time. It's really kind of also a timestamp, um, a message that will be out there about your company forever. Uh, that Kickstarter's up there, uh, whether you did great well or, or have a, an odd video. So getting that one right is important because you only get one launch. You only get one of these videos. So the more 2D prototypes, the more 3D prototypes you can make before that, the less risky it'll be to getting there. So here's a quick table uh, from the book about some of these processes. Um, I want to hang here for a second. Um, you know, a lot of what I'd love to, to get questions on in this session uh, are what your challenges are in prototyping. Um, so, you know, this is a quick table. There's obviously many more processes. Um, to quickly, some of the acronyms in here, 3D printing, you know, FDM is fused deposition modeling, your typical, you know, glue gun, glue gun on steroids, MakerBot type 3D printer, uh, and then SLA, SLS, and DLMS are centering processes, uh, and then CNC is machining. But uh, we can come back to this later, but I just wanted to, to get a bit of a framework out there and get you guys to start thinking about, you know, how can I prototype quicker? Because uh, the question I get a lot when I'm out there doing public speaking is, you know, hey, you talk about 2D prototyping, but I, I can't possibly do that for my project. You know, I have technology X, which will take 10 weeks to, to make one prototype. Um, and I think a lot of that's not necessarily changing your technology or compromising uh, your goals. I think it's just redefining the, the first prototype you need and what you can learn from it. Because uh, most often your first prototypes, you're really learning from your user, learning about your market, and not necessarily learning too much yet about, you know, the final manufacturing, um, the production methods that, that you'll eventually be into. Um, so think about this as we go through what I mentioned some other processes, because I'd love to field questions about uh, specific projects or, or processes people are, are interested in. So to dig a little bit deeper on 2D, 3D, and 4D, and then we'll, we'll jump into a great example of taking 3D prototyping farther. Um, so 2D prototyping, like I already mentioned, um, you know, whiteboards, napkin sketches, this is really the origination. And a lot of the benefit that I see there is the collaborative approach. Um, a whiteboard is very accessible. Everyone in the room can go up, you know, there's kind of a low barrier to entry to getting involved in, in the session. Um, whereas even if you're staying in, in two dimensions, you know, if you spend your whole time rendering something in, in Photoshop and send that around, you know, you're not going to get as much input. People are going to kind of think it's the final idea. Um, they're going to see that you put a lot of work into it, uh, and in some ways they're just not going to want to give you the, the raw, uh, brutal feedback that you need at that point to understand, you know, which ideas you should be prototyping, which ideas make sense to take out into the lab and, and keep going to that next level um, before, before you move to 3D. Um, and what I want to spend a minute talking about up in the upper left-hand corner is foam core. Uh, I'm a big fan of foam core. Uh, cardboard can be easier because you can just kind of grab it anywhere. Um, you know, cardboard and duct tape works as well. I'm a big fan of foam core and hot glue where you can just because it finishes a little bit nicer um, and gives that presentation feel. Um, for those not familiar with foam core or foam board, uh, think of it as like your, your elementary school science fair presentation posters. Um, it's that paper with a, a little bit of foam thickness behind it. Um, and what, what that allows you to, um, what that allows you to do is um, start to create uh, Two and a half dimensional forms, more complicated things, um, but stay in a form that really messages, you know, you're early, this is a prototype, you want feedback, um, and, you know, you can really start to create some complicated stuff with this uh, to get it in front of users. You know, the example in the upper left hand corner is uh, button layouts on some handheld keyboards, um, and it would just be a shame for someone to do a rush to 3D printing and have these complicated shapes and CAD and, and all these things. Um, laid in the, in the design uh, when they could have just, you know, had a 2D, gotten the layout, given it to a bunch of users, and, and learned more, and thus move faster by slowing down and going back to 2D. And two-dimensional gets a little bit more complicated, right? I mean, laser cutters are obviously what's really flat in the landscape on two-dimension recently. Um, Glowforge is obviously the biggest change in laser cutters lately. If you haven't seen that, check it out. 30 million in 30 days, biggest, uh, fastest crowdfunding in history. 
Um, and a lot of what they focused on is the two and a half dimension that you'll see after this um, and how you get more complexity out of 2D. Um, but there's a lot of benefit here. And this is really where you can also start to introduce the electrical, the firmware, the interface, and most importantly, side of things. Um, throw an Arduino board in there, have a button and an LED, um, just some like high level things to understand how will people interact with the product? What's their expectation? And it's really important to do all of that before um, you keep progressing. And like I've been saying, you know, two and a half D has a lot of power. Um, so I think this is a really cool little spider mechanism. Uh, and especially mechanisms, you can get a lot of progress in, in two dimensions and uh, really have some emergent complexity um, and solve problems. From a fundamental physics standpoint, it's, it's easier to keep it in one plane before you start adding more loads. So all this makes a lot of sense before you move to 3D. Um, this is, you know, more traditional on the left. We have a wave turning apart. Uh, and on the right, we've got, you know, some 3D printed bunnies, um, a MakerBot, and then a higher res. And um, these are very accessible these days, but again, the risk is, you know, showing a fully 3D printed part to someone, um, they might mistake that for, you know, your final manufactured good um, and be giving you subtle feedback about, you know, the radius and and the color and things like that, rather than, you know, the fundamental feature set, um, the product you're developing, and things that can really help you this early in the journey to make that pivot, make that change that will really end up um, in a much, much better product um, and growth path long term. And, you know, this is, to, to build on the framework a little bit, this is a slide I like to use, um, kind of my, my seven sevens rule. Um, you'll notice there are only six on this slide, but, um, I think a lot of this is just because it takes so long to do hardware in more traditional methods, you can move it even faster in low resolution. And um, what I like to highlight here is a lot of people are aware of the challenge of manufacturing. You know, the bottom of this, like, gosh, it takes seven months, it's a big slog, you know, thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, depending on your scale. Um, but even backing up from that, you know, a test cycle can take seven weeks to get all your prototypes together integrate, get the boards through bring up, and really see what's going on. Uh, just a simple prototype build, just machining, even expedited, that's going to take you a full week. Um, and a lot of what I'm getting at here, too, is what can you learn in a day? Because 3D printing, it's, it's really collapsed the landscape, but it's still going to take seven hours. That's still a whole day. That's still an overnight build. Uh, whereas foam core, you can rip through that with an exacto knife in seven minutes, get multiple iterations in front of a user in a day. Um, and, of course, whiteboard even faster. You know, it's amazing how many ideas you can get through in an hour before you spend seven hours 3D printing one of those ideas um, or seven minutes ripping through some foam core. Um, so I think it's really important for entrepreneurs to think about this at any stage in the process. Um, I like to use an example where we were halfway through a $7 million development project at Live Lab for a Fortune 500 company. And I jumped back to foam core when we were already in, um, you know, starting to even tool some parts because we had a, a fundamental challenge of, you know, hey, wait, what's going to fit in the box from an industrial design mechanical engineering standpoint? And uh, foam core was the fastest tool. So, um, you know, that's a lot of what I'm getting at here is, you know, use the best tool to help you move quickly because um, time is time is money in this industry. So I want to transition from there into talking a bit about manufacturing. Uh, because that is really kind of the holy grail and, and long-term goal for hardware startups, because that's how you're going to get, you know, massive quantities of parts out to out to consumers. Um, so injection molding is obviously the most common um, manufacturing process for plastics. Uh, just want to focus on mechanical plastics today, because it's typically the long lead item, high cost item uh, on the mechanical side. Um, so the tool you see in the background, I mean, that's just to make a simple whisk. And, you know, this is machine hardened steel. You see all the sprues, all the gates, you know, cooling channels are, are on the side that you can see there. Um, this gets pretty complicated. I mean, the tool in the background would likely be, you know, 10K, you know, maybe down to 5K, depending on, um, on the, the options you choose. Uh, but there's a lot of complexity there. You want to be refined with your design, done with your design. Um, and the, the big implication there is that they're just a high cost to iterate. Um, you shouldn't really be learning too much about uh, the form or your product by the time you get to injection molding. 
by the time you're there, you should really be focusing on the DFM, the design for manufacturability, and all the little details of, you know, the gates, the sprues, the injection marks um, to adapt to the process. Because at that point, you're really going to be adapting your design to the process rather than, you know, using the processes that can help your design move faster. Um, and it just takes a while. I mean, typical injection molding lead times can be 10 weeks or more. Um, you know, it's collapsed a bit. You know, we keep five, six weeks is more standard for um, single part tools without a lot of complexity or, or action or sliders um, or complicated features or what those create. Um, <clears throat> but it, it's impossible to get injection molded tools in, in less than a month um, without a lot of, you know, time, money, and relationships. The benefit, obviously, is you get much lower cost um, at this scale. Parts can cost pennies up to, you know, uh, dollars, but it's very rare for a consumer product level injection molded part to be more than five or ten dollars, um, unless you're getting up into, you know, automotive washing machines, you know, big old, big old pieces of plastic. You're honestly probably in the one to two dollar range. So those are some of the trade offs of injection molding. And so as an alternative to that, what I would like to talk a bit about today is a process called urethane casting. Uh, or silicone molding. So the big benefit here is it, it kind of flips the equation on a lot of the traditional rules of injection molding um, in a way that's more friendly for entrepreneurs and more accessible, which is a, a key point. Uh, injection molding, uh, there's pretty much anywhere you can go, you can find local injection molding resources, but one of the big challenges is especially in the U.S., most injection molders are still outsourcing their tools to China because that's where the knowledge base and the equipment base is. Um, whereas silicone molding you can do uh, in-house, you know, you'll see a team go through the process in our shop through this case study. Um, so very low setup costs. I mean, you can do this for about 100 bucks, depending on how many parts you want to shoot and the, and the materials you want to be using. Uh, which really means a low iteration cost. You know, throwing away a mold is not the end of the day. Um, that's just kind of the end of one cycle for you. Um, and short lead times. I mean, you can, you know, if you're really spending full time on this, you can do this in, in less than a week. Um, and even if you're outsourcing it, which is definitely an option between, you know, hand-done urethane casting and outsource injection molding, outsourcing urethane casting, uh, that can be done in 10 days to start having tooled parts coming off real tools for you. Um, from professionals, so outsourcing can be a middle ground there. And like I've been saying, it's just a good setup to get you ready for injection molding, start to learn about the design for manufacturability, and the process of molding. Um, you know, silicone molding is a little bit more forgiving. You're going to get more more free features on the undercuts and sliders and things like that because the tool is going to be flexible. Um, but all in all, it is the limitations of the process that you're going to have to start to work around will be much closer to injection molding um, than when you were designing your part for 3D printers or machining. Now, the one downside is high unit cost. Um, because of the materials and the scale at which you're going to have to buy them, um, you know, you can be paying $20 to $100 per part, um, but, you know, you've just saved $3,000 on an injection molded tool, um, so that can help you help you go faster. So now that I've given an overview, I'd love to go through a case study of, of the urethane casting process and look at a team that we had that used it very well. Um, so Fishbit, or Current Labs as they're known, um, they came through our program with pretty early prototypes. You know, you see a bit of the evolution here. And, um, you know, fundamentally, um, they started on development platforms, Arduino boards, like, like most entrepreneurs and makers do. And what we really help them do in Highway 1 that we emphasize is really helping turn technologies into products um, and become fully formed. Um, so what you see here is kind of that evolution from, you know, a couple sensors strapped to development boards to a more integrated 3D printed enclosure, um, continual refinement, and then uh, the final form that you see in the bottom right. <clears throat> and so what we were able to do through Highway 1, through helping them through prototyping while looking at, at manufacturability, um, was what we see on slide 24, which is not, you know, completely ready to go to an injection molded, injection molded scale, um, but you can really start to see the details forming here of the gaskets, the details, the assembly, 
um, and all of the considerations you are going to have when you go to mass production. And what they were able to learn about more by doing urethane casting in-house and starting to see where some of those issues would come up. So fish bit to step back quickly and explain, um, it's a very common business model that we've seen at Highway 1 and in the social innovation space where um, I guess I would phrase it as the first product is really going after the first world in order for a larger game to go after the whole world. Um, their first product is a connected fish tank sensor um, aimed at people with saltwater aquariums, um, so highly complex ecosystems. Um, people put a lot of time and money into maintaining them. Uh, and fundamentally, there's just not a lot of a great science and especially connectivity in the space to coordinate your data results uh, with everyone else. Um, so they've been, been successful at, you know, getting fish enthusiasts interested in this, um, getting units out there. Um, and a lot of what I'll talk through today is showing um, what they did as their pilot run, uh, which they clearly messaged on Kickstarter as a pilot run, which was helpful for them to say, we're only selling 30 units. That creates some amount of demand. Um, it doesn't commit them to shipping, you know, a thousand units if the Kickstarter goes big, which can be oftentimes more of a burden than a, a boon to entrepreneurs, um, but also gives them traction and, you know, really helps them go back to investors, go back to partners, go back to the market and say, hey, people want this. We sold all 30 units in two days. Um, there's going to be more demand uh, and really get that traction go to, the, to go to the next level. Um, so that's a lot of why they chose the Kickstarter pilot and, and emphasizing the low units. Um, but what's really interesting about their, their product and more of the big company vision is they're starting in fish tanks, but eventually the end goal for them is to be in um, larger aquatic ecosystems. Um, so basically, uh, fish farms are a macro scale of this. Um, so that's an issue where, um, you know, <clears throat> farming fish in the ocean has become pretty detrimental. Um, farming fish in farms is not super efficient. Again, one of those areas where it's not very data-driven. Um, so as they learn from the fish tanks, learn about the ecosystems, are able to, to increase that technology, leverage it in the fish farms, their, their end goal is to really, you know, increase availability of, of fresh food, um, of fresh meat, and really, you know, help to feed people. So um, it's something that we've seen common in the, the social innovation space at Highway 1 uh, is start with, you know, a high-value U.S. market in order to enable you to develop that technology, develop the algorithms, um, and end up, you know, going big, going big out there to the world. So now that I've explained a bit about Fishbit, I'd love to just run you through the process they went through uh, in, in urethane casting. So it can start as simply as a 3D printed part. So this is just an FDM part on our machines at Highway 1. Um, fundamentally, what you're doing with urethane casting is taking advantage of the fact that um, urethane and, and silicone do not bind to each other. Um, silicone is notorious uh, in engineering circles for silicone only sticks to silicone. Um, which can be helpful when you're trying to seal things and can be helpful in other areas. And it's really helpful here um, because it allows you to really make a truly softer tool um, where it's literally out of silicone. So the first pass they did of this, they 3D printed the parts, obviously did a lot of finishing on the 3D printed parts, used some acetone to blend the layers, do a lot of sanding to get a good positive, as we call it, create a mold about around that, and then start shooting molded parts from that. So this can start in 3D printing uh, and then eventually lead you to a lot of molds. So the molds I'm showing on slide 27 here, uh, these actually did eventually come from CNC parts uh, just because they wanted the resolution. They'd gotten enough out of learning from the 3D printing. Um, but even from a CNC positive, they can get to all these different molds. So you see, you know, four or five different molds here um, that they're able to continually crank parts out, you know, keep the geometry simple. You'll notice that these are all, you know, rather, rather flattish, you know, simple parts um, and, you know, no complexity. Um, and that enables them to quickly get into molding, you know, do this in our shop um, and save time and money by taking a lot of the, the prototyping and early, arguably, manufacturing burden into their own hands while learning about manufacturability. 
So slide 28, we see the team here in action. Um, so this is the CEO and the CTO, a, uh, a late night in the shop. Um, they're basically mixing up the chemicals here. Um, and so this is one of the big advantages is uh, accessibility to materials um, and really being able to, to get things and move quickly into urethane casting. Um, so Smooth On is kind of the most common vendor uh, for, for casting materials. Um, in the Bay Area, we have Douglas and Sturgis, which is a store that, that sells that um, and is very informative. This is definitely one of those areas where I would encourage you to go to your local store, go to your local vendor. Um, if you can't find someone local, get someone on the phone, because the people that know about this really love to talk about it, and they want to geek out with you. I mean, it's the kind of thing, um, it's not just like going to Home Depot and finding a screw. Um, these are the kind of stores where these guys live and breathe it. They nerd out on it. Um, they want to talk to you about silicone resin durometers, you know, and they really are um, the best local experts. So, you know, go out to the store, get get someone in person, pick their brains because you can learn learn quite a lot, quite quite a lot. So, this is them going through the process, and 29 shows the highly cosmetic parts that they were able to get out. So, this is a lot of the benefit is you can start to get some finishing. Uh, you're not really going to get the texture that you would in a machine tool, obviously, but um, you can make quite a lot of progress here towards something that really looked like a, a finished design good. Um, now, some of the trade-offs here would obviously be material selection. Uh, because you're using urethanes and not a lot of, of other resins, um, you're not going to have as much flexibility. Like, that was definitely a concern with Fishbit, that they're putting these into uh, saltwater aquariums, which obviously are going to be very detrimental, um, and so the seal was something that they bought off the shelf and, and obviously weren't going to cast um, because they wanted to make sure they had specific materials um, to protect the electronics. Um, so in terms of life cycle testing, uh, what they did for that in our lab was, you know, quickly cast some chips that weren't the full part, but basically throw those in salt water, um, you know, add temperature and, and cycle the velocity to expedite the process um, and see what's going to wear down. But also for them knowing that this is a pilot run, um, a lot of their goal was, you know, get stuff out there, get it in the hands of people, um, and even if they have to replace those 30 units later, um, you know, that could potentially be when they're manufacturing tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of units a year, um, and that's a small price to pay to get out there and show your traction. So slide 30 shows, you know, what they were able to get to by the end. So, you know, just having a lot of different parts, having repeatable parts is obviously a lot of it. Uh, learning that things aren't always going to be repeatable is something that's good to learn on your own before it happens with a vendor and, and um, you know, you think it's, it's always their issue. Um, that's why it's also helpful as an entrepreneur just to go through this, have to go through making the mold, have to go through pulling the parts out um, and learning where the error is going to be, where does my design need refinement. Um, you know, it's so helpful to learn that yourself rather than going directly to a vendor and leaning on them to learn about it um, when they already know a lot about this process. So uh, that's about all I have today. Um, thank you for listening to um, me talking about prototyping and manufacturing. I hope you guys all learned something. Uh, seeing some great questions come in on the, on the Q&A. Um, so I'd love to, to turn it over to Yana. And, um, and see which of those we'd like to address and, uh, and what else we want to cover with our time here. Thank you so much, Ryan. That was such a rich and concise uh, introduction. And uh, now I'd like to invite our attendees to, to please uh, submit your questions. I encourage you to submit them through the Q&A window. We already have some that have come in, uh, but do feel free to add yours. So uh, question number one, have you got any recommendations for companies which are good with international communications? Obviously, many of us can't nip down to Douglas and Sturgis, Sturg I guess, uh, streets in San Francisco, good reference. Um, they would need to be good both with technical advice and dispatch. So uh, just for context, many of our listeners are all around the world. So uh, any insights that you have for com recommendations for companies uh, would be very welcome. Yeah, I mean, my biggest recommendation there would be to look, um, go directly to the Smooth On source. So, you know, Douglas and Sturgis is our, our local rep. There's a few stores around the area. 
Um, but Smooth On is really the brand that creates and supplies a lot of these materials. Um, so it's it's just Smooth, S-M-O-O-T-H dash O-N. Um, go to their website. Their website totally looks like it was designed in the 90s um, by, by GeoCities or something, but it's got <laughs> a ton of information in there. Um, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty deep. Um, and I believe they have lists of, of local vendors there. Um, but honestly, if, if you can't find a, a local, uh, shop for this, I would basically go directly to the smooth on source, um, start trying to call them. Uh, and the other thing is, is learn from other entrepreneurs, right? So, you know, dig into kind of who's, who's doing this process in the area. Um, the other thing is vendors. Like I said, uh, urethane casting is a process that, you know, it does not scale to the level of injection molding, but um, there are ways to scale this higher. Something I didn't really touch on in the presentation was you can do urethane casting with uh, aluminum tools. Um, it doesn't have to just be silicone. There's a lot of benefit to that, but doing aluminum tools, you could get, you know, a hundred, hundreds of parts out of that, whereas a silicone tool honestly is going to degrade, could be 10 parts, best case 50 parts you're going to get out of that before it dies. So going and talking to a vendor that does urethane casting, urethane molding, um, lighter runs, um, you know, um, <clears throat> low volume, high mix is a phrase that you hear a lot for these kind of um, medium sized manufacturers. So trying to find a manufacturer, trying to find other entrepreneurs in your area that have gone through the process, uh, or also just getting directly in touch with Smooth On would be my recommendations. So in terms of other guidelines relative to urethane casting versus injection molding, and you noted that um, the unit costs uh, can be actually quite high for urethane casting. Um, so any guidelines in terms of, you know, if you're actually looking at this many units, I would recommend going this route versus another? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, uh, like I like I briefly touched on in the in the last answer, urethane casting does scale a little bit. Um, I mean, what I would say for like doing a silicone mold in house, that's really, um, I mean, you could make one part out of it. I, I wouldn't recommend doing it until you really need like ten or more parts. If you're doing one to five, just three D print them, get them out there, move quicker. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, ten to a hundred, you know, mold it in house with urethane casting. Um, you know. 100 to 1,000, start to outsource that um, to a vendor for urethane casting. Because the other thing, too, is they're going to have a better idea of the repeatability of that, right? Every mm -hmm. shape's going to be different. Every project's going to be different. Every material's going to be different. But they should have a much better idea of look at your design and say, okay, I'm going to be able to get, you know, 150 parts out of a silicone mold or 5,000 parts out of an aluminum mold. Um, and here's kind of what those, what those costs and times are going to look like. Um, so going to an expert can, can help you figure out um, what's going to work in the middle of that. And the other option is, you know, going to injection molding early for what mm -hmm. we typically would call a risk release. Um, and basically that, that what we mean by that is saying, hey, there's a high risk that 20 weeks from now we know we're going to need injection molded tools. We might get this wrong the first time. You know, we have the budget. Let's make maybe an aluminum, maybe not a hardened steel tool. Um, but let's make, you know, a soft tool, bridge tooling is what they often call it, um, to basically get some injection molded parts out. You can start to do certification then, which is another big big benefit. Um, if you have SEC or UL requirements, you're not going to be able mm -hmm. to do that. Um, with, with cast parts, most likely you're going to need injection molded parts and resin. Um, so that, that can be another option is going to injection molding early, knowing you're taking on that risk, uh, but also to have in your back pocket that, hey, we've got this tool tooled up, so... Anytime we need a part, it's now just a dollar, not 10 weeks and, and thousands of dollars. Of course. So I'm going to swing it all the way over to your discussion on 2D prototyping um, as, a, as a great starting point for uh, all of the innovators that are currently joining us. And one of the uh, things that we've heard, especially in technology for development, is how communities often perceive uh, initial 2D, very basic prototype um, as the final product, and, and the impressions are, are so challenging to change. So could you speak a little bit about um, 
effective methods for engaging uh, individuals or communities and, and providing feedback, but really helping them to understand that this is part of a prototyping process. Uh, what is it focus groups? Is it individual that are one-on-one? -on -one? Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think a lot of that is not only in framing your prototypes correctly, but as you briefly alluded to, framing the, framing the user groups correctly, finding the right users who are going to understand what phase you're at, understand um, what, what level of input you're really looking for, um, which is pretty accessible these days. I mean, there's definitely a knowledge out there of what it kind of means to be an early adopter. You know, not everyone's going to use the phrases, you know, early adopter and fast follower and all these things, but most people have heard of crowdfunding these days. Most people mm -hmm. understand the idea of, you know, waiting in line at an Apple store for an Apple launch. You know, there's definitely a cachet to getting something first, right? right? And so in some ways what you're looking for is the people that want that to the nth degree in your industry. You know, they're so excited about what you're doing, they're not only going to wait outside the store the first time you sell it, they want to be a part of your innovation cycle. They want to be having that first prototype. They want to have that before anyone else does um, for many reasons. I mean, that could just be it's a technology that helps them with a problem. Um, you know, they have allergies. You have the best air purifier. They want it now. Um, <laughs> it could also just be, you know, they're, that's how they, um, how they look at the world. You know, the early adopters mm -hmm. who just want the first Apple Watch, want everything off a of Kickstarter um, and want to see the cool new stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And trying to find the people that are really, really the honest early adopters in your in your market um, are going to give you the best feedback on that. Um, mm -hmm. And then really kind of trying to frame the session. Um, something our teams do a lot is is doing controlled focus groups, um, and that can be helpful because you can see a what what feedback are other people giving. Um, you can kind of give everyone the same priming to say like, hey, this is. Um, and a lot of times it's not even saying like, hey, here's my prototype, because again the outside world, you know, prototype to them might mean a prototype is just a one-off of your final mm -hmm. of your final thing. And so a lot of times it's just framing it uh, in the messaging. It's saying, hey, here's my idea. Here's my project. Mm -hmm. Here's what I'm thinking. Where should I go with this? You know, right. and it's kind of giving them those open-ended questions as well to really give them the opportunity to, to do something interesting with your idea, you know, and saying, you know, hey, what do you think of this? Where should I go with this? Um, what would you want in a product like this? And not, as a lot of entrepreneurs do when they go out there, just trying to validate your own idea, just kind of showing right. them and saying, hey, isn't this cool? Don't you think we should make exactly this, you know? Um, millions that's not, and that's millions what you don't want to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. And there's just a, there's a tendency for that. Um, it's, there's nothing wrong with that. Every entrepreneur sets out to solve their own challenge, right? And that's right. what makes people passionate about their project. But at some point when you're far enough along in that, you just need to go out you know, expose yourself to that feedback um, and kind of humble yourself as an entrepreneur to say, okay, well, this is what I thought I wanted. What do other people want? What does the market want? What's the right feature set for that? What's the right price point for that to make sure that you're not going to have something that's either under-featured and doesn't help people or mm -hmm. overpriced and over-bloated and, um, you know, you, you hit the market too late. So, again, a lot of that's just honing in on your, your minimum viable product. How long do you recommend that people spend prototyping generally? Oh, man, that's, that's a hard <laughs> question. I mean, I, I guess the, the answer would be like one day to ten years. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it depends on what you're – are you trying to get to the moon or are you are trying to, you yeah. know, have a better phone case for your earphones that, that won't get stuck, right? Like there's a lot, yeah. of, a lot of range there. But I, the, the way I typically answer that question is it's whenever you stop learning. You know, it's whenever you kind of get to the point of like, hey, I just did another focus group. They're kind of telling me what I already knew. Let's go back in the lab and do another cycle, right? right. And that can be the hardest thing for entrepreneurs to do because it's also you're going to have a team. You're going to have different opinions. Um, <clears throat> you know, the CEO might be saying like, hey, why are we doing any of this? Just give me the product so I can go fundraise with it. Whereas, you know, the CTO is saying, well, hey, the tech works. Why do we care? And the, the product guy can be saying, well, we need to go make sure there's a product around this technology. So you know, within your team, it can kind of be a, a debate to figure out, you know, what's kind of the incremental benefit of every new person we show this to. Um, and also, a lot of that can be showing it to new people. Like, great, start with the extreme users who you think would buy at the Kickstarter. 
um, but eventually, you know, go to more partners, go um, to, the, to the marketplace, so to speak, go to buyers at retail and distribution houses and say, hey, is this what you guys would want um, mm -hmm. as you get closer? Because they're going to have a, a interesting, much more data-driven view on the market more than the individual use cases. So in, in terms of sharing your prototype, one of one of the big concerns oftentimes is intellectual property, right, and then having somebody else rip off your idea um, and benefit from all your hard work by just uh, taking your prototype and, and manufacturing it and going to market. Um, so the practical advice for entrepreneurs who are out there distributing their prototypes and asking trusted sources, should they be considering including a non-disclosure agreement? Is there, um, you know, good practices that will position you to avoid uh, being the victim of intellectual property theft? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, my, my personal opinion on, on IP is <clears throat> people overemphasize it in general, um, especially early phase entrepreneurs. You know, every time we have you know, lawyers come to Highway 1 and advise and give lectures on this. They're always just shocked how obsessed people can be with getting their <laughs> provisional patents in when they don't have the prototypes done, right? Mm -hmm. And so I guess I would point out a few things here. Um, one, it's somewhat difficult to include IP in foam core, I guess is how I would say <laughs> it, right? And that's kind of the, the benefit of abstracting your prototype to 2D, abstracting it to foam core, because at that point you're really just saying, you know, hey, I – I'm trying to make a connected blank. I am trying to solve problem X, right? Mm -hmm. And if, if that's really the level of conversation you're having with people, um, those ideas are out there. And that's something as well as like, we've got 7 billion people on this planet. If your idea is kind of like, you know, connected alarm clock, connected bird feeder, connected, you know, something, a hardware product that already exists and you're just kind of adding connectivity to it, bringing into the 21st century, um, there's at least 10 other people on the planet working on that five of which you've never heard of, and four of which will never launch, right? So mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, the risk in the hardware market these days is not having that new idea. It's refining that idea, getting that idea out to market, going through the pains, you know, raising fundraising, going through manufacturing, and, again, finding that new viable product that's the right combination of feature sets, cost, and the experience that you deliver to a, to a user um, and hitting that middle ground. So... You know, I think that, that entrepreneurs can get a little bit too precious with their ideas, um, and I would just encourage you to get it out there. Now, at some level, it's definitely appropriate. Um, where we normally see that NDAs coming into place with users is definitely not in focus groups because you're also creating an environment there, right? It's right. kind of like a focus group. You want to bring them in. Hey, here's some juice and some cookies. Let's get you on a sugar mm -hmm. high and have you tell you, us how awesome this product is. Um, you don't want to start it with a legal downer, you know. Um, but but where, where it can be appropriate is beta runs. So if you're really sending, you know, your entire product out, you know, the plastics, the boards, the embedded firmware, which would be right. pretty impossible to rip, but um, if you're really sending the whole thing to someone, um, it's totally appropriate at that point to have um, some sort of NDA because you're probably going to have some sort of light contract or at least document with them anyway saying, hey, I'm giving you this prototype for 30 days. In exchange for that, you just promised to give me feedback. You're not going to pay me, or maybe you are going to pay me. That's obviously um, a big thing as well, is if you can get people to pay for those prototype units, that's traction to show investors and say, hey, I haven't even started manufacturing yet, and people still want to buy the prototypes. Um, but it's at that level where you're really like handing off your prototype, doing extended trials, which is something we didn't mm -hmm. talk about too much here, but it's really important for us to see at Highway 1. Really, when you're doing extended trials and handing over your entire prototype, that's the point to get some NDA language in there and, and protect yourself. Mm -hmm. That's very, very helpful advice. So I'm going to take it over to a much more specific direction regarding uh, some of the prototyping methods that you noted. And in this case, uh, choice materials or best materials, best practice materials, if you will. Uh, this question is uh, specific to a uh, listener's project, uh, do you recommend acrylic for prototyping for small casing for a projector and sound system? So maybe we can expand, we can address that question, but also expand further on what are some of the typical materials and uh, recommended materials in terms of prototyping, um, especially when you're looking towards um, high resolution. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so to start with that specific example, I mean, acrylic would be appropriate there uh, just because of the scale you're looking at. I mean, part of what that makes me think is um, acrylic is 
most commonly used in light pipes. So light pipe is basically um, the little connector pieces that basically help your LED shine out to the outside of the product, right? So this is where you see um, logos lit up, you see, you know, different features and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. That's what we call light pipe. So uh, acrylic with a vapor polishing finish is normally most appropriate for that. Um, so especially, I mean, if you have a projector project, if there's any lensing, if you need anything optically clear, um, that's where you would definitely want to be going with an acrylic. Um, and it's also going to be, you know, very, very easy to machine um, and, and get that first box out there. Um, mm -hmm. But more commonly, when we see someone moving from 3D printing to CNC, um, normally what you see is either um, ABS. ABS is a very common material. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the big benefits there is ABS is machinable and it is also injection moldable. Um, right. And that's a lot of what you want to start to learn when you get to um, the, the higher resolution 3D is um, getting um, really getting to learn about the strength of the materials. Is my mechanism going to work? Is my, um, you know, FEA that I did in CAD going to hold up when I get to that point? Um, so ABS can be helpful for that. Um, mm -hmm. Also, Delrin is a very helpful machinable plastic. Um, we'll often use that because um, ABS can also kind of get gummed up on, on CNC bits. Um, mm -hmm. So those are a few, and polycarbonate would be the other one. So those are a few of the more common materials that we see in CNCing. Um, and part of what you learn there is, again, from the strength, um, what are you going to need to do when you go to injection molding? Do you just need a different resin? Do you need a higher strength resin? Um, or do you need to do some fiber filling? Um, I think I saw somebody mention that in molding earlier, because um, you can put glass or even carbon fiber fibers injected in the mold um, to strengthen it up. So there's areas where you're going to get more strength and in injection molding um, just by kind of doping the plastic from what you did in your machining prototypes. All right, cool. And um, I'm going to be coming to an end here, so if anybody has any burning questions, please uh, bring them out there, but I'm going to uh, throw one out to you regarding um, maker spaces and, and if you have any thoughts on um, maker communities as a, a great or useful mechanism for refining prototypes and, and engaging uh, with like-minded individuals and any suggestions for international folks at all that you want to share uh, regarding uh, making um, maker space opportunities? Yeah, maker that's space a great access. question. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think a lot, like, makerspaces to me are a lot of what has created hardware startups, as we now mm -hmm. call them, in the last five years. Like, when I started working at hardware startups out of college, we weren't calling them hardware startups. We were just technology startups that had a bunch of hardware. Um, and I think that it's really been that flattening of the landscape in terms of prototyping that's enabled people to get out there, that's enabled people to learn more about it get their hands dirty and go do that. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, tech, tech shop is obviously the biggest example, um, you know, but again, to your point, not everyone's going to have a local tech shop. Um, and normally what you'll see uh, when you get farther out in the world is these, these scrappier maker spaces. Um, and I guess my advice to them would be, um, you see a lot of emphasis on um, tools and especially when, when I go to them, a lot of what I see is electronics. A lot of what I see is like, oscilloscopes and power supplies and things like this, mm -hmm. um, and then maybe one 3D printer. And I guess what I would say, encourage people to do is, you know, it's great if you can get that 3D printer, but if you can't get that 3D printer yet for, for any number of reasons, um, start in 2D to, to where we started this conversation with, um, you know, foam core, even if foam core isn't accessible, cardboard and X-Acto knives, <laughs> there's got to be some version of that you can find locally, right? So. Right. I would just encourage people to, you know, get scrappy um, and help help people start making and, and getting in front of users as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and then also just to, to engage the community, you know, and I think a lot of the maker spaces typically will come out of a community, come out of a university, come out of an area, um, but think broader, you know, who are the big companies in the area um, that, that want want to help because mm -hmm. they were a small company like, like you were 30 years ago. Um, they have interest in having exposure to the talent in the area. They want to know who's coming to the maker space. They want to know who that who that thought leadership in the right. local area is. Um, so reach out to the big companies. Reach out to the governments. Uh, reach out to the universities because um, they're you know it might take a few 
a few tries to find the right pathway, but there's going to be someone there that wants to help you, um, and you can find a lot of win-win partnerships there. Very encouraging, and we, we seem to have one very specific question that was hidden a little bit, but uh, I think we can address it as our last question. So uh, this particular listener acknowledges that he knows nothing about materials, but if making a disposable cheap electronic part and potting that device, is there a material interaction with electronics that need to be considered with prototyping materials that will be or could be in contact with the circuit board and electronic components? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so for those that aren't familiar, potting is basically uh, coding or really uh, submerging a circuit board in a resin or plastic material to protect it from water ingress in the elements. Um, you also have conformal coating that's more of a coating, but that's an advanced process. Um, honestly, a lot of it depends on the specific material you're using. You would be surprised how often hot glue is an effective potting material. Um, <laughs> I would not suggest hot gluing your million unit run <laughs> um, but if you're if you're trying to get ten beta units out there, absolutely, you know, hot glue is appropriate. Um, and then it's the kind of thing where it's like that's what can help you prototype, that's what can help you move fast. Um, and eventually, what you're going to want to do is you know go to the vendors and research more. Um, you know, Hinkle, who owns um, the Loctite brand, does a lot of this. 3M as well. Um, they're both known for being very friendly. Um, you know, you can get in touch with a person. You can get more feedback. Um, and really understand what the limitations of your of your board materials and resin are going to be um, before you really go to a proper potting material. Because um, there are a lot of challenges there, too, in terms of potting on a manufacturing line um, is really a timely process. So curing could take up to 24 hours if you don't have a UV cure adhesive or something more advanced. Um, <clears throat> so I would encourage you to, you know, go fast with something like hot glue. My one asterisk there would be, um, don't burn the board because that's going to be your, your issue um, with a lot of um, processes. That's basically why you often don't see batteries uh, inside products that are injection molded. You normally see a battery door. Part of that's for service, but honestly, that's mostly for manufacturing um, mm -hmm. because molding, molding inside the mold would bring your um, battery above its operating temperature. So, um, <clears throat> you know, be careful to check what the operating temperature of your ICs are, of your electronic components. Um, but other than that, I would just start with something simple like hot glue, look into a more complicated epoxy, um, and start working with vendors when you need to do more units. Thank you. That's very helpful. So that was our, our last question. And with that, I'd, I'd like to thank Ryan for taking the time to join us today and, and answering all of our inquiries about prototyping and a budget. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us from wherever you may be today. For those of you who are seeking PDHs, uh, code is listed. If we didn't tackle your question or you are inspired uh, to ask additional questions, please feel free to email us at the webinars at engineeringforchange.org. And I invite you again to become the first team members to hear on our, about our upcoming webinars, especially those focused on hardware in the next few months. Um, with that, I wish everybody a, a good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending where you are, and thank you. Take care.